Hello everybody, next talk it will be load testing web services at Mozilla with Molotov by Marek Ziad. <coughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Uh, so everyone speaks French here. Can I switch to French or no? Okay, well, too bad. So I'll have to do it in English, I guess. So I'm going to talk about Molotov, which is a load testing tool. Uh, we're writing uh, at uh, Mozilla to do some uh, testing on our web services. Um, and if I have to give it a definition in a single sentence, it's a Python 3 load testing framework that focuses on web services. Um, so before I present the tool itself, I want to take a little bit of time to explain what we're doing, doing at Mozilla in terms of uh, stuff we deploy in the cloud. So Mozilla is much more than a, a browser. Uh, so how many people here use uh, Firefox? Woohoo! Well, it's the FOSM, so. Um, so when you use Firefox, you have some web services that are uh, interacting with your browser. For example, if you want to uh, synchronize your bookmarks, it's going to call a web service in Python uh, on one of our server and stuff like that. And we also have big web applications. So uh, the two well-known applications we have, web apps that uh, we maintain is the Mozilla Developer Network, which is like a, a pretty awesome website where you can get some help about CSS, uh, HTML, and stuff like that. It's usually the one that comes in when you search on the internet about uh, something about JavaScript. It's usually Stack Overflow or MDN that comes in the, in the first uh, results. Uh, there is also the Firefox add-on. So basically, every time you install a, an add-on in Firefox or Thunderbird, uh, you get to on this website, so, um, it has all the add-ons you can install and also has uh, some service uh, to update the add-ons you have installed on, on your browser. So those are web applications. And then you have numerous web services uh, that uh, we uh, maintain to make everything work. Uh, so uh, I can't have the full list here. There are probably more than 50 web services out there to, to make the whole um, Mozilla ecosystem works. So uh, one of the biggest one is Firefox Sync, uh, the one that is going to let you synchronize your, your uh, history, your bookmarks, and stuff like that uh, across your devices. Uh, there is another one called Screenshots. Now you can take some screenshots in Firefox and uh, share some screenshots. And there is a, a new one that's pretty cool. You can share. Uh, a file uh, uh, that gets encrypted on the client side uh, to someone and it's going to stay in the cloud for I think a month or something like that. So that's an experimental one but it's uh, something that might stick around because people like it. Uh, I think the file limit is one gigabyte so you can share some pretty cool stuff with that. So all of this, those are, are web services. And if I had to give a definition of what's a web app, I would say that it's a application that gets called, queries some backends, and spits some HTML for the end user. That's roughly the definition I would give about a web app. Uh, on the other side, web services are like a subset of a web application. It's a restish application that most of the time uh, spits out some JSON. And so basically, uh, you have an API in, H in uh, HTTP where you can call slash item slash blah, 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 and use the right verb and get back some JSON, send some JSON, and do some stuff like that. So it's uh, not meant to uh, be displayed in your browser, uh, but it's useful when you want to do some stuff uh, with the data you get. So web service, web app. And if I go de <coughs> deeper in into the difference, I would say that a web app has a part that gets executed in the, the browser if you have some JavaScript. It also uh, stores some cookies and sometimes uh, uh, keep a web socket open between your browser and uh, the server. And it has a specific user authentication uh, uh, flow. For example, if you're on Strava, or and you use a third-party application, you might do an OAuth dance between the two websites, and uh, you, the, you have to enter your, your 
your uh, login password and then uh, grant access to an application. And all that work is done with the user, with the user interface. And last but not least, uh, web applications usually have a lot of caching. I was talking about MDM and, and um, AMO previously. Those are big Django websites. And we want to make sure that we call them the least often possible because Django can be slow in some queries. So we have like a lot of uh, caching in front of Django to make sure that uh, the pages are, are fast enough. So stuff, static files are pushed in CDNs and stuff like that. So web application usually have a lot of caching. On the other hand, web services usually don't have any caching. They're as dumb as possible. They just want to get queried, uh, ping some database, bake some JSON, and send it back as fast as possible. So it's, it's pretty, pretty isolated. It's pretty simple. And it's uh, meant to be an application to application transaction. Uh, so you have to have a client uh, that's uh, smart enough to understand the JSON you get back and do something about it. Uh, for instance, in Firefox, when you use sync, it's going to do all the encryption on the client side, uh, send some uh, uh, queries to Firefox Sync, which are like dumb queries. Hey, please store that encrypted blob. And, and then when you want to uh, synchronize stuff, you're just going to call it, and it's going to stay as dumb as possible. And so that's, for me, the biggest difference between a web application that is smart, uh, displays user uh, interface, and do a lot of caching, and a web service that is roughly a window to all the data or, or uh, uh, calculation you have on, on the server side. And it stays as dumb as possible. And as a matter of fact, the trend in the past two, three, four years has been to uh, implement microservices, which are, are trying to make sure that each web service you deploy and use ha ha implements a single feature and doesn't try to implement a bunch of different stuff. So what do we test web services? <clears throat> so basically, uh, uh, at Mozilla, when we want to deploy new web services, the first thing we do when, when we start to do some uh, uh, stress testing is to make sure we understand how the web service works. We want to make sure that uh, we understand its behavior and we understand uh, how things are supposed to work. So we're going to start to uh, implement some scenario uh, that are uh, trying to be as realistic as possible and then start to send some load. And eventually, uh, the, the one of the goal, of course, is to find its bottleneck, but uh, the goal is not to fix the bottleneck. The goal is just to understand how the application behaves and what are its bottlenecks. Uh, so uh, maybe we'll fix them, but maybe we won't fix them. It, it really depends on the cases. But that's basically the reason why we want to test the, the web services. And once we know how an application behaves, it gives us uh, an idea about how we're going to deploy it. Since we deploy everything uh, on Amazon, uh, on the AWS services, we want to do some sizing. We want to understand what's the best size of VM we're going to deploy on Amazon, depending on the application, and stuff like that. So maybe I should mute my telephone. So uh, when we're stressing an application uh, and we load test it, uh, we have a few things that are happening in, in the box that gets stressed, the, the server. We're going to use some RAM, we're going to use some CPUs, and we're going to use some FDs. So FDs are file descriptors. And basically, every time your web service or someone that calls your web service interacts with the server, it's going to use a socket. And a socket is a file descriptor that gets open on your box. So those are the three main things, the three main resources you have on a, on a, on a server that uh, is going to get exhausted when you uh, use all of it because you're stressed by, a, by a, your client. And sometimes some application uh, just are so slow that we don't even have the time to eat all the CPU or RAM. Uh, so that's another case. So the goal of the stress test is to make sure we understand when it happens. And we want to make sure that when it happens, uh, 
the uh, web service uh, is not behaving in an erratic way. So we, we had a lot of cases where uh, you start to do a load test against a service and everything, everything starts to crash. Uh, and then uh, after you did your load test, when you try to use the web service uh, with a single user, nothing works anymore because everything is borked. Uh, all the connectors in your web service are, are in a state where it's not able to, to work anymore. So we want to make sure uh, that uh, our uh, web services are not behaving like that. Uh, we also want to make sure that when uh, things are not, uh, uh, when the server is not able to cope with the load anymore, we're sending back some clean errors. Uh, so usually for web services is all the errors that si starts with 5.0. So this is a list of all the problems we get when we do some load uh, testing uh, at Mozilla on our service. Uh, the first one is, so how many people, so this is a Python talk, so how many people here implement uh, Python server uh, service or application? Please raise your hand. All right, so how many people use Flask or Django? Okay, cool. Um, so basically, when you're dealing with a Flask or Django or something similar uh, application, uh, the biggest problem is its lack of parallelism, uh, which means that a Flask process or a Django process will um, uh, take one request at a time and won't be able to uh, do it in an async way. And that can be, some, that can be a problem in, for some uh, web services, maybe it's not, but sometimes it's a problem. And even though uh, uh, Flask has some feature where you can go multi-threaded, most of the time you don't do it because it, it opens a, a can of worms. So usually a Django or a Flask application is a single uh, process, single request at a time uh, service. And when you start to send a lot of loads on those, uh, the stack up uh, in the, the web server in front of them, like Nginx or Apache or whatever, they start to stack up a lot of requests that are waiting for the process to, to take the next one, and you usually get uh, timeouts really quickly. Uh, so maybe for some web services, it's not a problem, but for usually, if you want something that scales well, uh, you have to avoid this kind of issue. So this is not true anymore if you're doing some Python 3 and use uh, stuff like AIO, HTTP, or framework like that, because in, in, in that case, uh, uh, they're able to uh, accept new connection uh, even though uh, the, the um, request uh, that's being uh, 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 respond is uh, still going on. So uh, usually uh, uh, if we need something that goes fast, we ask people to avoid uh, Django or Flask and to try to do something that accepts uh, multiple connections. Um, the other uh, thing we all often see is I.O. bound errors. So basically a web service, 90% of the time is just an I.O. bound application that opens a bunch of sockets to other services like Redis, Memcache, or database, or stuff like that. And it has a lot of sockets open to the service. And if you don't do the thing right, if you don't like manage a pool of connection, if you're not uh, taking care of uh, recycling the connector that gets borked, you get issues like that. Uh, you get too many open files, so, so that's when, uh, when we uh, load test a, a web service that doesn't re properly recycle uh, sockets. It's going to open a lot of FDs on, on your server, and at some point, it's going to spit out some errors like that. You get too many connections from the database. That happens when you interact with Postgres, for example, and you're not, you're not uh, taking care of uh, limiting the number of uh, parallel connection on uh, Postgres, it, it can happen that uh, Postgres start to, to send back some error saying that, hey, stop it now. So you need to be careful about that. Uh, the other one we see often is MySQL server has gone away. So who knows about this message? Yeah, this, this is uh, the crappy message. Uh, the MySQL server will send you back uh, when you're not doing anything with the socket. Uh, so basically, MySQL will just shut it down. So if you don't have something in your web service that recycles the sockets uh, when they're not used, you're going to hit this issue. And of course, connection timeouts. Time, timeouts. 
And the last one we see is when we exhaust the memory. So for example, if you have an application, a web uh, service that puts a lot of data in a local Redis, and it's, it adds more and more data, and if the scenario we use uh, uh, is adding uh, data at will uh, in Redis, at some point, your memory will be full, and that's when uh, trouble happens. Uh, depending on the system, you may have uh, places where the OM killer, a little process that runs under Debian, for example, is going to uh, look at what's going on because uh, it's running out of memory and just kill uh, your process and or even uh, restart the server. So you want to avoid that. And this is the three kind of problems we find when we load test uh, uh, our web service. So what's a healthy web service? A healthy web service is not a service that's going to like uh, support hundreds uh, uh, Ks of requests per second or whatever, uh, because sometimes you don't need that. A healthy web service is a web service where you understand its limit and which has good enough performances. That, that's the, the most important stuff. You know that a web service if a web service is supposed to handle, I don't know, 100 connections per second, and if you load test it and you're able to do two, 300 connections per second, you're good, you're good to go. Uh, the other stuff that's super important is to make sure that when you send a lot of loads and uh, the, the web service is resilient, it's, it's able to get back on its uh, feet, uh, which means uh, it spits out a lot of 500s, and, and when uh, you start to use it as a reg regular load, uh, everything works uh, as it used to work. So um, if we don't have that, we don't give the green light to the green light to the web service for it to be deployed. And last but not least, you want to make sure, especially at Mozilla, that the service has a path uh, for scaling. Uh, even though we're going to deploy something. Uh, that's good enough for the load we're expecting. We want to make sure that we know how to scale it. Uh, some service is going to be super simple. We're going to add uh, some new box uh, in uh, Amazon. Like, uh, okay, uh, we have more users than expected. So instead of having five box, we're going to add 50 box and that's it. But sometimes, depending on the design, uh, if you're not doing the proper sharding on Postgres or whatever, you might have uh, cases where it's harder to add boxes and just have the service uh, cope with more load. So you want to make sure that uh, you think about that uh, um, when you do the scaling. So uh, one very important stuff. Uh, in the past five or six years, I've never seen any web service that worked uh, uh, directly when we load tested it. I've never seen it. I mean, even the service we built, uh, all of them will fail when you start to do uh, some load testing uh, because you always have to have a round of tweaking all the configuration, making sure you do the right stuff with Postgres or MySQL, making sure that your pools are doing the right stuff, tweaking all the timers and stuff like that. So unless you're Chuck Norris, it's pretty, I'm pretty sure uh, the tool we're going to use are going to break your stuff. That's mostly guaranteed. All right, so how do we load test uh, a web service? So it's pretty, well, it's pretty simple, the pattern. We send some load with a realistic client behavior. We don't want to do like crazy fuzzing stuff like sending some, I don't know, uh, bytes super slowly or doing some crazy stuff to try to kill it. We just want to send some load like if it was like regular client. We want to collect some metrics to see what's going on and we're going to do it again and again and see what's happening. So to do this, you have two ways to do it. You, you can use a laptop like this, start to send some load to you, your service, or you can do a distributed test uh, across the cloud where you're going to have like, I don't know, 100 boxes uh, trying to, uh, to interact with your endpoint. And depending on the cases, uh, sometimes you want to do some distributed load tests, and sometimes you, you, you can just use a laptop to do everything. And, and frankly, uh, most web services we're testing, we're able to kill it with a single laptop uh, because 
most uh, web services are I/O bound, and as long as you send a lot of concurrent uh, requests, you're going to break it. So you don't need like a very expensive distributed system to break stuff. The only case we have at Mozilla where we need to deploy a lot of uh, nodes to do a, a massive load test is web push, because we have to keep WebSocket connection open for hours to see how the server behaves. So in that case, you can't do it from a, a single uh, spot, so you have to deploy something. But other than that, uh, uh, just this laptop, as long as I have the bandwidth and the network, I can break any web service uh, at Mozilla with just uh, one tool. Metrics. So one thing that's super important about metrics, uh, there are a lot of tools out there that you, when you start to do some load testing, they're going to tell you that your server uh, is able to do 500 requests per second, and then you run the same test from another box, and suddenly you have 2,000 requests per second because that other laptop has a better uh, network connection. And then you trying it on your grandmother uh, um, laptop, and suddenly you have 10 requests per second. So the problem is all the tools that provide client-side metrics uh, are taking into account uh, the network round trip, the network congestion, and what's going on in the laptop you're using. And uh, I don't think it's a good metric. It doesn't mean anything. I mean, when Apache Bench tells you that your server is doing that many requests per second, this number is not really uh, useful uh, to, to work uh, and to understand what's going on. What you need to do is to have metrics on the server side. You need to make sure that all your web services you're deploying have a good metric system based on something that uh, is gathered somewhere. Uh, for example, on, on Amazon, uh, we use tools like Datadog that provides live metrics uh, using StatD or stuff like that. And this is what you want to use when you do some load testing. You don't want to uh, rely on a client-side metric. So existing tools. Before uh, I wrote Molotov, I looked at what was existing. Uh, so we have Apache Bench, but to test web service, it's not useful because you can't write complicated scripts uh, unless you try super hard. Uh, Apache Bench is just uh, sending some uh, load on HTTP endpoint, and it's pretty limited. So this is out of, uh, of uh, question. There is Boom, another tool uh, I've created that mimics Apache Bench, but same thing. It's not used to do some, some complicated uh, uh, load testing. It's used uh, to do like smoke tests, like just kill uh, one endpoint. And then you have a bigger tool like Apache G, uh, J Meter. So this is a Java application where you have to spend hours to click around to create your 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 uh, load test, and then you can export an XML file, re-import in it. I mean, yeah, never say wrong thing about other technology. I'm not trying to bash Java or anything. I'm just saying that uh, JMeter, uh, the user interface, is not meant to create uh, web services uh, um, load test. It's basically a better Apache bench, so it's not the right tool to do some uh, uh, proper load testing on web services. And then you have Grindr. So Grindr is a Jython uh, framework. It's pretty cool, actually. You can write everything in Jython. So you can create some uh, Python module and have them executed in the Java uh, interpreter. Uh, but you have to have a lot of gigabytes of memory to have it running. And uh, well, <coughs> sometimes we want to run a load test that's going to like call a few endpoints. We want it super fast. So if this test is going to eat like two gigabytes of memory, it's a little bit uh, of a pain if you want to deploy it on Jenkins and stuff like that. And then you have another one called uh, Bees with Machine Guns. That's the coolest name. I'm, I'm mad that they don't make t-shirts because I'm pretty sure those t-shirts will be cool. Uh, so Bees with Machine Gun is an uh, or orchestrator that will allow you to do a distributed load test on Amazon. Uh, you create a small Python script, and then bees with machine guns take care of uh, creating micro Python instance on Amazon and try to kill your box. So this one is pretty cool. But in our case, most of the time, we want to do something locally. So it's a little bit overkill for what we want to do. And then there is Locust. So Locust uh, is in Python. It's using gevent and 0MQ. It's pretty cool. 
Um, we've tried to use it, but there are a few limitations. Well, so it's, it's meant to uh, work as a distributed thing. Uh, you can also run it locally, but it uses zero MQ, which means if you get a network split, you get some issue with the zero MQ pipes because uh, it's going to break and stuff like that. Uh, so that's my next slide. No, no, no. Yeah, that's my slide about it. If you want to do something distributed, it's super hard to do it properly uh, because you have to take care about what happens if uh, you have network splits and stuff like that. And when you do a load test, if you want to do a load test that uh, is happening for hours, uh, you can't rely on, uh, on queues like 0MQ. Uh, you have to do something that's uh, disconnected. You have to collect all your data using something uh, that's meant for it. Uh, and uh, that's why we ended up uh, doing something. We ended up relying on Amazon to do all of those things because now in Amazon you have a built-in orchestrator and you have tools there to do all the orchestration, to do all the data exchange. And I don't think it's a good idea uh, in 2018 uh, to build your own uh, client server system to do some load testing. I think it's better to rely on uh, what's there in the cloud, Amazon or other tools. So uh, given uh, that, our plan at Mozilla is to provide a simple tool to write load tests super quickly. We want people at Mozilla that are not familiar with Python to be able to write uh, uh, load test by copy and pasting uh, other existing load tests, so we want to keep it simple. And from there, when we have a load test that's able to uh, load test a uh, web service, uh, we just put it in a Docker image, and when it, we need to do a distributed load test, we use Amazon and Docker to deploy and orchestrate a massive uh, load test that can run like 200 and 300 boxes uh, on Amazon. But like I said before, most of the time, uh, we just take the test and run it uh, on a laptop and break the service and, uh, and go see the dev and say, hey, I broke your service in two seconds. Now you need to do something about it. So Molotov, yeah, so that's uh, slide eight, 19. So now I can talk about Molotov. So Molotov is a non-distributed uh, Python 3 load testing framework. Uh, we wrote using Python 3. Uh, and it's super simple. It's simple because we want, like I said before, uh, anyone at Mozilla to be able to write uh, some load tests. It's highly extensible. It's a framework where you can add uh, extensions. It has a lot of uh, concurrency. It's based on coroutine, like the native coroutine we have now in Python 3. So you're able to run uh, uh, tens of thousands of uh, concurrent requests from a single uh, uh, process. It can, it can run uh, as multiple processes, and it's based on AIO HTTP, uh, which is a framework based on uh, Python 3 async IO. Basically, if you're familiar with uh, requests, uh, which is a synchronous uh, uh, client to do some uh, HTTP, uh, AIO HTTP client is Roughly the same thing, but uh, using uh, um, uh, async programming in, in uh, Python 3. So one laptop running Molotov, this laptop can generate over uh, 30,000 uh, requests per second against any endpoint as long as I'm connected to a real network. So basically, using coroutine in Python, you can break most web services. So this is a simple example. Is it big enough? Can you see over there? Yeah, cool. Uh, so that's the simplest example. Once you import Molotov, you have a, a bunch of, um, OK, well, this there's a syntax error there. So the scenario decorator is part of the Molotov package. So let's say it's import from Molotov import star, OK? So a scenario, uh, when you have, you have a coroutine, you decorate it with a scenario decorator, and from there you get a session object, which is a client, an HTTP client that you can use to uh, to uh, load test your your server. And from there you can just look at the AIO HTTP uh, documentation, 
it provides a very simple way to interact with a, a HTTP server. And here, I'm doing a get on HTTP some API. I'm getting back a response, and I'm checking that the status is 200. So that's pretty simple. People that are not familiar with Python or did it a long time ago, at first, they get a little bit uh, worried about all these async words. Uh, they don't quite understand what's going on there. But it's OK. I just tell them to copy and paste this example and change the URL there, and that's it. I mean, that's the only stuff to know. There is async def and sig with, and you're good to go. You can do some load testing. And once you have this module, you can do Molotov example.py, pass it a few uh, options, and bam, you have a load test. And in this example, I'm running 10, I'm forking 10 processes, and each process runs 200 uh, workers, a worker being a coroutine that's going to call over and over uh, this scenario until it breaks. And the dash x option here says, OK, run that. And as soon as uh, the, there's an error, stop. Of course, you can create more scenarios. Uh, <coughs> here I have two scenarios, do this, do that. The second one is uh, checking for what's going on, uh, the data you get back from the server. And when you create two scenarios like that and you run it with Molotov, uh, each time a worker has finished with a scenario, it runs, uh, it picks randomly, do this or do that, run it, finishes it, picks randomly the next one, etc. in the loop until you're over. And you can put some weight because here, since it's random, after a bit of time, 50% of the time you're going to do do this and 50% of the time you're going to do do that. So here you can put some weights. You can say, hey, I want 90% of the time I want to do that, and 10% of the time I won't do this. So writing Molotov scenarios in, uh, uh, to do some load tests consists of creating one coroutine per scenario, specifying the, the weight of the scenario to be as realistic as possible from what your using our users are, are doing with the web service, and then uh, call the Molotov uh, uh, command line. And, and it's also useful to, I mean, it's, it's also a good documentation for people because they can look at uh, the load test here and know that the scenario that's in do that is represent 90% of the user of uh, the calls that are made on, on the web service. Uh, we have test fixtures. So you can create a function that's going to set, for example, an authentication header. For example, uh, it, might be, uh, it might take a few seconds to build uh, authentication header if you want to interact with some OAuth server or stuff like that. So here, in prepare some stuff, I'm creating a variable called auth where I'm storing an uh, auth header. And then in a scenario, I can call back this uh, um, variable and use it in my header. And uh, this is basically the life cycle of a Molotov test. And we have decorators everywhere for you to uh, do something. If you want to like, create some stuff before the test runs, you're going to use global setup uh, before the test is launched. You can do some stuff per worker. That's the setup um, decorator. You can do stuff at the session level when a worker creates an AIO HTTP uh, client. And when it's destroyed, uh, you can you have three different uh, tier downs at the session level, at the worker level, and uh, at the end of the test. We have an event system uh, where you can create a, a function that will receive events every time something is happening in Molotov. Uh, we sent a request, a response was received. Uh, we, ha we have updated the number of uh, active workers. A scenario starts. The scenario was successful. A scenario failed, etc. Uh, and so this is useful if you want to do some stuff uh, to keep track of what's going on at, in Molotov. We also have extension. So this is a use case where. For example, you want to dump all your results in a single file. So you can create a module here called CSV dump, where 
you're going to implement an event that records every time a request is sent, and you're going to hook yourself in the teardown at the end of the test just to dump this list of uh, requests you did. And once you've created this file, you can just use it uh, in the command line with the dash dash use extension option and tell people, okay, every time you, when you run a load test with Molotov, you can use my little CSV dump file and uh, have your uh, test dump some result in a, in a CSV file, whatever. You can run it from Git. Um, <coughs> Let's say you have a Molotov test in a Git repo, and uh, you want to uh, run it from your uh, laptop or your CI system without having to, do, uh, to install anything. You can use Moleslev, the name of the repo, and the name of the test. As long as you have a Molotov.json file at the top of the repo, Moleslev is going to clone the repo, look at this file, find the test, uh, find the scenario, and run it for you. You can even add some option like requirements. That's going to pip install some stuff in your environment before it runs the test. You can set up some environment variable. So it means that if I uh, install Molotov, I can slave any repo as long as they're public, and it's going to run the test for me. I don't have to install locally uh, the test. And I can run it from Docker. So uh, I have a Docker image that has Molotov installed and run Moleslave. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. You do Docker run. You provide the repo, the name of the test you want to run. And it's going to do the same thing, but inside a Docker image. And we want to do that because in our CI environments, if we want to run a load test uh, against a project, uh, we have to do it in the Docker images, so we can use that too. All right, so feeder summary. Uh, <clears throat> so in Molotov tests are simple coroutines, Python coroutines. We have a weighting system to, for scenario distribution. Uh, we have hook, hooks everywhere uh, during the test, so you can add some code if you need. We have events, we have extensions. You can run stuff from Git and you can uh, run in Docker. So that's level one in, I mean, in your hierarchy of needs in load testing, that's level one. Level two is taking everything I've explained and put it in a CI so you can do some continuous load testing. Uh, the goal here is to make sure that every time your developers change something in a web service, you're able to deploy the new version of the web service somewhere and rerun your test, your load test, to make sure there is no uh, uh, load regression, speed regression, performance regression. OK, thank you. That's it. So, so just one question. Uh, so the logo is from uh, Juan Pablo Bravo. He's doing a lot of cool icons if you want to check them out. It's CC BY. If I create a Molotov t-shirt, who wants one? Please raise your hand. OK, cool. OK, cool. That's good enough. I'll do some. Hi, um, great talk and a cool tool. Uh, just another one uh, that wasn't on your list, uh, Gatlink. If you uh, can you speak uh, louder? Uh, another tool that wasn't on your list it's called uh, Gatlink. Gatlink? It's yes, written okay. in Scala with uh, Aka actors. Uh, it might be worth checking out. Okay. I'm um, also wondering um, how easy do you think it would be to extend? Uh, this for something like a uh, database uh, testing. Uh, database testing, like uh, calling some TCP instead of HTTP? Uh, effectively, yeah, connecting with something, uh, like database well, connector running some queries and scenarios with weights. Yeah, you would, you would have to uh, plug in uh, another session object instead of AEO HTTP uh, client. 
If you uh, provide the same API, I don't think it's a lot of work. Cool, thanks. Any other question? Here? Hi, I'm currently uh, using uh, PyTest to do similar things like calling an HTTP API and uh, also WebSockets. Um, so what benefits does uh, Molotov have over PyTest? Uh, okay, so uh, PyTest is not going to uh, create uh, a lot of coroutines and run them in parallel. In PyTest, uh, when you run something, it's meant to run uh, single time everything. So the only difference is that Molotov takes care of running a bunch of coroutine uh, co for you and shutting them down. Okay, so um, yeah, one of, one of my colleagues is actually currently working on uh, also using parallel execute or in implementing parallel execution oh, okay. well, in the, the test. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so then it wouldn't, probably wouldn't give us a big benefit over well, you would have also to deal with your uh, session creation uh, for the HTTP client. But yeah, that's, I mean, if you have uh, something that does that, it's very similar. Okay, yeah, thanks. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, do you think we can use uh, Molotov to test uh, systems that uh, scale uh, up automatically? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, uh, can you speak louder? My question is, uh, uh, do you think we can use uh, Molotov to test s systems that uh, scale up automatically apps when uh, the load is too, too high? Oh, yeah. So, uh, well... Well, you can test and make sure that it scales uh, automatically, or you can shut down uh, the auto-scaling, see how one node behaves, so you know when it's going to auto-scale. So okay. that's what we do. Okay, thank you. Is there some? Uh, so, a small question. Is there any kind of uh, example of what kind of output Molotov produces or uh, uh, what, what kind of output can Molotov produce and what kind of, uh, let's say, reporting uh, information can it uh, So, provide? Molotov is just uh, uh, showing you that something is going on. You get back all the tracebacks when something goes wrong. And uh, uh, if you run a test that lasts for, I don't know, uh, 10 minutes, you're going to have like a progress and stuff like that, but that's it. Uh, if you want to add more stuff, you need to use the uh, hooks to, to add some more information. But uh, most of the time, we run it and we look at what's going on on the server side. So, yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. Just a question. One of the, uh, I've used Locust. And one of the nice things uh, that I found in Locus was the user feedback. So when you were developing your, your test, you kind of, you, you start it, you see what's going on, then you can stop it and then rerun it. And the web interface is, is also nice to show to your end user or to, to, to have some graphical feedback. How easy would it be or what kind of UX do you have in Molotov to see what it's doing as it goes? Yeah. And um, any chance of getting a web view of that? Right. So on the client side, it's pretty limited. It's just a command line and we just a progress, you know, and uh, we'll only display uh, tracebacks because everything else, we do it on the server side, on Amazon consoles and Datadog. So we don't have any uh, fancy user interface because we don't really need it. Uh, I guess Locus is better for this and for some use cases, it's better maybe to use Locus because it has that you can show to people and stuff like that. But for our use case, we didn't need that, so. so. No more questions? All right, thank you. So I'll be around in case you want to chat and stuff, and thank you. Hey, Mark. Hi, how are you? How are you doing? It's been nice. a long time. Yeah, nice to see you again. Yeah.
Uh, yeah, awesome. absolutely. Well, in in a Working. Okay, this is another microphone for the questions that's working actually. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you. You know you know what to do. Okay, cool. Um do you know the general stuff you need to do? No. Okay, so basically one of you needs to introduce the speaker. Um, just say the name, maybe the title, um, when it starts. Then you need to give them uh, normally it's like 45 minutes. Um, these five minutes of questions, and then 10 minutes you can leave and go to the next talk. Uh, so yeah, so keep get get the time up and agree them beforehand. Tell them where you're sitting. And then share like 15 minutes, 10 minutes, and then five minutes. Fine. It's not going to go over. So what they have to plan for one hour, they have to actually. Thank you. 